Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into quads. Learning about quads today, and you just finished up a leg session, didn't you? I did, just about 15 minutes ago. Still sweating. It's hot in here. <laughs> Do you have any quad work today? I did. I had the leg extensions, and then I also had a, a heel elevated split squat. Mm. Well, I'm excited to get into those and maybe hear a little bit more about those later in the episode, but let's learn a little bit more about what the quads do first. So what is the main role or function of the quads? The quads are going to be pretty simple. So the main function is going to be the extension of the knee, and then it's also going to be a stabilizing muscle group for the knee as well. Gotcha. And are within the quads we've talked about with some of the other muscle groups of having different divisions, is there something we need to know within divisions, so to speak, or different parts of the quad? So there's going to be four main parts of the quad. Um, as of recent research, I think as, as early as 2021, there's a fifth head to the quad that they have been able to uh, substantiate. I don't think they've given it a name yet, but the four that have been uh, identified with a name <laughs> are going to be the vastus lateralis. Then you're going to have the vastus medialis, and I'll, I'll give more context to this. The vastus lateralis is going to be the outer portion of the quad. The medialis is going to be the inner portion of the quad, more closer to the knee. Some individuals may call this more of a teardrop. You're going to have the vastus intermedius, which is going to be more down the middle or the <laughs> intermediate portion between. <laughs> and then you're going to have the rec fem, which is going to be the only portion of the quad that's going to cross over the hip. Um, and then this fifth segment of the quad that's going to be up near the hip as well. They don't have a name for it yet, but they're seeing it in cadavers and it's very interesting. Gotcha. And just a reminder, if you are listening to this and you're like, I'm having a hard time visualizing it, we do have a cheat sheet in the description box and or the show notes so that you can see the visual of what we're talking about. Because I know I'm a visual learner, so it is very helpful to see like a picture of what we're talking about so that you can have that all um, in front of you if you want to. Absolutely. Is there anything, I know we've talked about some things within the origin or the attachment and that we don't need to know the specifics for everyone, but those can come in handy when we're talking about how that functions when it comes to your form, the execution, how we cue things. So is there anything that we need to know within where it is attaching or originating? So the quad is going to extend along our upper leg and it is going to attach across the knee and onto the tibia. So that's going to be a big part of the knee extension and flexion that it's going to be involved in, mostly within the extension, of course. And then it's also going to cross the hip. And I talked about the rec fem a little bit. And so this is something where we need to have a lot of strength through that rec fem if our goal is to strengthen our glutes or what have you. And we can get into a little bit more of that context, but it's going to cross the hip joint. And then it's also going to cross the knee, which is very interesting for just a muscle in general. Yeah. And I think that talking about like the activities that it helps with, again, for people to see how it works in your day to day, because with you talking about, okay, being able to strengthen some parts in your quad is going to help within your glute training. A lot of times people see it as I'm training my quads or I'm training my glutes and they don't see how it synergistically works together or how things Things might antagonistically work with each other. And I think that that's a really important thing because when we talk about some of those daily activities, things like sprinting, running, walking, any kind of kicking movement, um, standing up from a chair, all of those are going to use the quad. And I know that when it comes to the hamstrings, those get a lot of love when people talk about sprinting. And it's something where you can't 
do the sprinting with all of the hamstrings if you don't also have some of that development within your quad, um, which I think is just a cool thing to be able to knit together to see how everything in the body does work together. And it's not going to be that just one muscle is isolated. It's that there are going to be stabilizers. There are going to be muscles working together to take out that action that you're trying to accomplish. Sure. I mean, it's going to be involved with all of your lower body actions that you'd be taking. So it's going to be important important for you, especially just from a, a functionality standpoint to be able to train your quads, your glutes, your hamstrings, your calves, the whole nine. Mm -hmm. And another thing is it's going to help you even walking upstairs. So if you think about like any of your daily activities, you're likely walking and or going upstairs. Maybe you're not sprinting or running or kicking, but walking and climbing stairs is something that we almost all do daily. And so being able to have that strength in your quad is really important. Absolutely. And especially as we continue to age and we sit more, uh, whether that be from sitting at your desk or whatever the case may be, we just don't spend as much time in activities as we get older. And uh, what I'm seeing within my clients personally who are 50, 60, even 70 years old is that the more that we can focus on the strengthening of their quads, the strengthening of their hamstrings and their glutes, the less knee pain and lower back pain and hip pain that they experience because the muscle groups that are going to be stabilizing those joints or supporting those joints are finally getting strengthened because it's not something that they may have had to think about until they started to experience the pain. Um, um, and they may have not been training their legs all that hard. And then now we're in this place where it's like, it's important for your functionality and your well being. It doesn't have to be this crazy situation <laughs> where you're squatting 400 pounds every yeah. night. Um, we can do some different exercises, but it really is such a benefit to your overall well being to train and for this particular episode, train your quads well. I absolutely love that you brought that up because a lot of people, of course, might have an aesthetic goal and we're about to talk about what the visual apparent appearance is within training quads, but there's so much functionality within just being able to train your body in general and lower body training, especially as you age is so incredibly important. So I love that you made that note. But going into the visual appearance, I think it's going to be good to talk about, and I love that we have a male and a female uh, approach to this, but being able to talk about some of the things you see when you're training quads visually. Man, uh, so many. I think that quads from a visual perspective are such an addition to mm -hmm. the visual representation of your body. Yes. <laughs> I'm a, a huge believer in this, especially in the the season of style that we have where five inch and six inch shorts are the like the thing that everyone wants to wear and being able to have some density to your quads makes those shorts fit so much better. Like nothing looks more off than someone wearing those shorts with almost no leg tissue Yeah, or it being, yeah, it's just like, their legs are really skinny and it does not complement them well. Whereas someone who, especially with like the lateral head or the vastus lateralis, that's a big part of those shorts fitting nicely and giving you some width to the quad. Of course, the the medialis, that, that teardrop component of the quad is also going to play a role because that's what's going to be showing a lot in those particular shorts. And so if you're not, if you don't have the development there, those shorts are just not going to fit you as well. So um, it's a massive part of just having a complete look, especially in the summer. Yeah. And I think that for women, a lot of times they don't want to train maybe their quads specifically because they already feel like, oh, my quads are so huge, or that's just going to make it be that I have these huge thunder thighs. And I know growing up, I kind of had that thought process too, of if I train my legs, legs, and I used to visualize legs as basically just my quads, then my legs were just going to get really big. And you even said the other day, I was walking around in shorts and you're like, it's crazy how much your entire leg and the shape and look of it has changed. And previously, it used to be when I wore shorts, I just kind of felt like it was not blobby, but it just kind of was like my leg coming out of my shorts. There was no definition to my leg overall. And that's what made me dislike my thighs as much as I did is because they just had no muscle tone. And I think that that's where it comes in of people saying they want to tone up and people get irritated with 
with that. But I try not to get irritated because you actually do want to tone up. You want to add muscle tissue and you want to lose fat. And that's what toning is. And so being able to train your legs and train your quads allows you to do that. And what I will also say to the women who think my quads are already huge, I don't need to train them, it could be body fat. And so being able to go through a dieting phase and see where that goes and know that for women, where we store a majority of our body fat is going to be basically from our belly button to our knees is where a large part of our body fat is. And that can be something where you just have to accept to a certain degree of I might have a little bit more body fat there, but that's also of maybe to push past that. I either have to go through multiple dieting phases or I have to push to a place that's a little bit uncomfortable during a dieting phase to see how much of that is fat or muscle. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'll, I'll say this, this is my bro science and my experience to things is there's not going to be research that's backing this, but I do believe that by training the tissue, if you feel like you have a, a bolus of, of fat in a particular area, again, bro science, not something that's going to be backed by science here. But if you're training a tissue with an area that has a greater overall body fat, I do believe that there's got to be some benefit to getting a greater circulation of blood flow as well as nutrients being pushed to the area. It only makes sense that there would be an opportunity for better utilization of the stored body fat in the area if that's what we're doing by training the tissue in that surrounding area. Again, not backed by literature, but it, from a, a logical perspective and understanding how things work, I think there has to be some correlation there. Well, it's funny you bring that up because there actually is more literature coming out oh, really? on spot reduction. Actually, in the March issue of Bill Campbell's um, Body by Science, had to have a little blink there. Uh, his March issue, it's going over some spot reduction cool. studies. And I was actually able to be the expert on the March issue. So if you want to hear my input on it, then you can go check that out. But it's cool to see some of the research coming out more and more when it comes to that spot reduction. That's exciting. I'm excited to read it. Some other things that can really improve within your visual appearance is your posture can improve. And you might be like, I've listened to a few of these episodes and basically for every muscle you've said your posture can improve, but that's because it can. Of Again, training your body, being able to utilize your body in a functional way is going to allow you to have better posture. Um, and there's actually even some research coming out. Um, it was a study published in the Journal of Rheumatology found that quad exercises can lower the risk of developing knee osteo osteoarthritis and help prevent degenerative wear and tear. So it can prevent injury, manage chronic conditions like arthritis, heart arthritis, arthritis, <laughs> heart disease, diabetes, um, and it can even help with your gait um, and making sure just because it does really contribute to your knee flexion and extension, um, that's going to be a big thing when it comes to your actual gait. So that sensory input from your quads can help maintain that proper posture, um, which is just going to improve your look overall. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I would say, and we talked about the, the rec fem a little bit, and it's uh, attaching on the, the pelvis. And when we have, I know many of our listeners want to grow their glutes and get the juiciest glutes on earth. And so a lot of your volume is biased towards growing those glutes. And with a lot of that volume being posterior, you're going to get build a lot of strength as well as muscle density to that posterior chain. And that's going to potentially pull the pelvis. If we don't have an equal balance of strength to the anterior muscle groups that are pulling on that pelvis, it's going to push the pelvis into more of a anterior pelvis pelvic tilt and pulling it back and giving you maybe some lower back pain. And so this is also something from a visual perspective of how like you may be feeling like you're constantly dealing with distension through your lower abdomen or, or having a tough time controlling your core because you're in that anterior pelvic tilt and you haven't strengthened the rec fem or things that are going to be around the, the hip flexor. And so spending that time strengthening the rec fem is going to pull you into more of a neutral pelvic position, which could also have you feeling better through your abdomen and from a presentation perspective, you're going to be, because you feel better, you're going to look better as well. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of visual improvements. What are some other just benefits overall to training quads? Everything. I, I don't even, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're going to be able to do a lot of different movements, uh, especially within your lower body training at a higher strength threshold. So I think that there's just so many benefits that come with 
strengthening your quads. Yeah, it makes everyday activities easier, like we mentioned, really helps with a kneecap stability, which I think is a huge one that is often overlooked. And since we have talked about some running for you, it even supports speed and running and just athletic performance all overall. I hear a lot from clients of, I just want to feel more athletic. And that's something where being able to train can then translate over to having some more athletic performance overall. Another benefit that comes to mind is going to be a a dream of mine growing up. A dream of mine is that I wanted to dunk a basketball so bad. <laughs> wanted to dunk a basketball. There's actually a hilarious video um, from 2018 mm-hmm. of me trying to dunk a basketball that you have and I get rim stuffed and it's, it is an embarrassing video. <laughs> My video. quads were far too weak at that time, I suppose. <laughs> but your quads are going to play a large role in being able to be explosive from the floor for things like dunking a basketball. It's also going to be something where when it comes to cycling and kick an ass on the Peloton. This is, you know, this is in a previous life of mine where I really just got after it on the Peloton. Um, quads are an important piece of the puzzle there as well. Mm-hmm. And like, even though I've mentioned the knee a few times with a more stable knee, that's going to create that greater agility for you to do some of these more athletic endeavors as a whole. And one thing I would be remiss if I didn't mention is how much having strong legs can help with pregnancy. It is one thing I hammer home to any of my clients that are pregnant or become pregnant is that we need to really double down on the leg training. Of course, the core training as well. We do a lot with core work, but to be able to carry the heavier or increasing load of your stomach, having strong legs is going to be so instrumental. And like you talked about of keeping your pelvis in the best spot, because with that stomach and being heavier, it can really cause a lot of lower back pain, a lot of dumping over, being able to have have those strong legs is going to help so much. Amen. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You, you should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are weight. needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats knees. are great. You for should your squat ass over toes. It's fine. It fits my mattress. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. Consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Do you want to go ahead and get into some common training mistakes people have? What's the first one that comes to mind for you? I would say range of motion on the leg extension specifically. And I used to fall into this camp too, but when it comes to the leg extension, I see a lot of people getting to the point where their leg is almost all the way straight, but they don't get that last few degrees that they fully need. And that's what's really going to help get that quad to that fully shortened position. And the leg extension is one of the only exercises that is going to train the quad in the fully shortened position. So if you're cutting yourself out of that last few degrees and that full range of motion, then you're really cutting yourself out of a lot of the work that you're already putting in. Now, that is the hardest part of the movement. So I understand why people skimp out on it, but that is going to be some of the most benefit you can get from the movement. I'll stay on the topic of the leg extension. I think in part to people not getting fully extended at the knee, they're not getting set up in the leg extension well. They're just like jumping in the leg extension and being like, all right, I just have to kick this out. It's like, Mm -hmm. there are going to be things that you need to have as a checklist of getting your knee in alignment with the pivot joint. There's going to be like a little dot that's yellow, some are red, um, that you want your knee to be like perfectly aligned with. And then we want to have the pad, not just like resting on our ankles or on the top of our feet. We want it to be more on our shin. And then we want to be able to be in a place on the seat where the our, our knee is going to be pressed up nicely against the the seat itself. We're not having our knees like far in front of the pad and kind of floating. And then we also want to be able to secure ourselves with the handles um, and be able to lean back. If we can lean back, it's going to allow for our bias towards that rec fem to be even better if, it, if your um, leg extension allows for it. And so I think getting set up properly is mm-hmm. big. And then the second thing I would add within the leg extension is that to 
many people generate a ton of momentum from the beginning. Yes. And then they're just basically through the entire concentric portion of the exercise, just decelerating the momentum that they started with. And then they're like, why do my knees hurt? Mm -hmm. And then why is why is the pad like flinging off and then it's too light and, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, we need to have more control through the beginning. And it's more of an, an acceleration exercise as we get past that first like 15 degrees of knee extension, then we start to accelerate and we have a much greater bias towards the quads. Yeah. And within you talking about pulling yourself into the seat, I would say that's a common mistake I see is just people's like butts lifting up from the seat as they go ahead and do that leg extension. So that's a great point there as well. Dude, somebody on, on YouTube, multiple people on YouTube actually were like roasting me for saying that I use the Versa yeah. grips on the leg extension and being like, are you joking me? I use the full stack at my gym and I don't have to pull myself in. And I'm like, bro, there's literally <laughs> no way that you do that. It's just impossible. <laughs> I saw one comment and it was like, why don't you just use a seat belt instead? And I know that there are machines that specifically in the past used to have that seat belt to kind of like lock yourself in. But I feel like that's not doing the greatest job because if we think Think about, let's say the seat belt is coming from like in front of you, then that's not pulling you down. And if it is coming from below you, there's a very small chance that it's going to lock you in in the right way. And so just being able to pull yourself into the seat is going to be one of the biggest things. Yeah, I would I would opt for the Versa grips first and foremost. And if you don't have the Versa grips, the seat belt's going to be a kind of a second best option, I guess. I would say another mistake I see within training is that there's been a lot of fake news going out that you should not allow your knees to go past your ankles. And so people- or your toes. Yes, your toes. So people are very scared to have their knee go past their toes or just get out of a place where the knee is lined up with the ankle. And it's something that within quad training, because it is training within that knee flexion or that knee extension, then we want that knee to be able to drive forward a little bit more than, let's say, something more glute biased. Sure. Yeah, I think that being able to drive the knee forward is a big part of this. And people can be limited for a number of different reasons, whether it be how they set themselves up in the exercise. We think of like a barbell back squat, or we think of a leg press maybe, or a split squat. And we think about how we're getting situated in whatever the contraption may be to better bias that knee flexion to, to, to transpire or that knee driving forward while we're staying more upright to create the greatest bias towards those quads. And so this is where utilizing a heel wedge is going to come into play because what is often the limiting factor is going to be ankle mobility. And so someone's ability to get deep into the squat and create a lot of knee flexion can be limited by how tight their calves are. And so a way that we can work around this, of course, we can improve the overall mobility of the tissue, and that's going to be more of the long play. But in the instantaneous moment, utilizing a wedge, like a 10 degree up to a 20 degree, I wouldn't go past a 20 degree wedge um, under your heel to improve that knee flexion, but it plays a big role and makes the quad training much, much, much more productive. Mm -hmm. I would say another mistake kind of going off of that is trying to make certain exercises work for you when it might just be best to choose another movement. So I know squats are obviously very popular for leg training. And it's something that I used to hear a lot of like, you can't develop your quads or your legs if you don't do squats. And it was something that I became very self-conscious about because squats were very difficult for me. And it was something because I have a longer femur, then getting into that position and having that amount of ankle mobility was just, I had to put so much output and so much thought into it that I couldn't get the full output from the exercise. And that's not to say I never squat. Actually switching to a safety bar made a big difference for me and having that heel elevation. Like there are things that you can do, but instead of trying to force yourself of someone said I can only squat to see the strength gains that I want to see. Unless you're in a sport like powerlifting where you have to squat for something, you don't have to squat. 
And I went multiple years without squatting and having someone who's very intelligent at programming, aka Alex, be able to make sure that I was still able to see the progress in my quads that I wanted to. And so instead of forcing myself to do a movement that I thought I just had to do, I was able to work with my body instead of against my body, um, be able to figure out how squats work, but also how I can do other exercises that I might get better bang for my buck personally. Yeah. And I think that that's the big benefit of these episodes is that we're teaching more of the functionality of the muscle. And once you understand how the muscle functions and how we are trying to target the tissue, you can really set it up whatever is going to be best for the person. You don't have to be married to specific exercises. It's like, I understand what I'm trying to accomplish by training this muscle group. What are the pieces of equipment that I have available to me and how can I apply this to my understanding of the muscle? And then you go from there. And that's going to be the beauty of these episodes that you're going to be able to take forward um, into your own training. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and now another common training mistake, which I know you feel passionate about, is not training quads because they are, quote, quad dominant. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't love that. Um, <laughs> because I, I like more often than not, when people come to me and say that they're quad dominant, it's a situation in which it's like, all they want to do is train glutes. And it's like, if you want to train your glutes, we've got to have at bare minimum, a strong rec fem, and we've got to have strong hip flexors so that we can maintain overall pelvic stability. And that's pelvic stability is a large part of being able to grow your glutes. And so um, that quad dominance is always something where I have to go through a lot of exercise execution feedback. And I, it transforms because they're like, oh my gosh, all these exercises that I thought I was trying to target glutes with, I was really doing just a lot of of, of quad work that I was not intending to. And then that volume just was way too much. And my quads were just basically chronically inflamed. And I was just never actually recovering. And then I was in this place where it's like, I, I have these massive quads. And then we're able to adjust things, get them into actual exercises that put them in a place where we're actually training glutes. And then when we're trying to train quads, we're training quads. And then they're able to see, um, as well as you know, some individuals just needing to lose some body fat in that area. Um, those two things alone make a, a huge difference. So if you feel like you're quad dominant, I, I mean, if, if I was to put it into a percentage of individuals who have reached out to me and said, I need to, need to stop being quad dominant, I want to grow my glutes, the people who are actually quad dominant is less than 5% of those people mm -hmm. easily. Um, it's just, it's just simply, it's generally not true. And if you were to be quad dominant, I would imagine that your glutes are also pretty dense as well. Like you wouldn't have zero glute tissue and have a bunch of quad tissue. Like it would, it's just not, there's so much crossover within the exercise selection where both of them are playing a role that you wouldn't have all of one and none of the other. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned the inflammation. And especially since we talked about quads being a part of cycling, I had a client and she came to me and it was an aspect of she was doing so much cycling because she was trying to make her legs leaner. But with doing so much cycling, her legs were so inflamed constantly. And so then it put her in a place that within leg training, she didn't want to do any quad movement and was very scared of like how her legs were growing. And it was something where we kind of pulled back a little bit, made sure she had her recovery in place, and she was able to drop a decent amount of weight actually with us increasing food and see her legs come down and be like, oh my gosh, everything that I was doing to try and bring my legs down was actually causing them to look the way that I didn't want them to look. Yeah. So if you feel like you're quad dominant, let's look at the program design and really get to the bottom of it. Yeah. Any other common training mistakes that you see? I would, I would just add range of motion in general. Um, to get to real a lengthened quad and get to a lot of knee flexion, it's going to take a long range of motion and it's not going to be the most comfortable. It's going to be a, a painful route more often than not to get to that type of depth. And many individuals are not really willing to push to that point. And so that all being said, range of motion being accomplished is something that I, fe I feel many lack. I agree with that for sure. Now, I know we kind of talked about programming, but are there certain mistakes that you see time and time again when it comes to the programming of quad exercises? I don't know if it's so much that there's programming errors because there's only such a select number of exercises that are going to be training the quads um, directly. And even sometimes when people are performing the exercise incorrectly, they're still getting a little bit of quads just because of how the exercise is set up. 
So I would say if there was an error in, in programming, um, it's probably not being specific enough in that execution to better bias quads if the goal is to grow quads because everyone's limb lengths are going to be different as you talked about. And so you do need to be very specific when you're in a place where you're wanting to grow your quads or you're wanting to grow your glutes. And so setting the exercise up properly is tremendously important. So the air and program design would be to not be looking at exercise execution videos. Mm -hmm. Now talking about exercises, do you want to go into some of our favorite exercises to train quads? Sure. What's your, what's your number one? Number one's that leg extension. Leg extension is number it. one. Yes, because it is the only one that's going to get it to that fully shortened position. I love the stability of it, just being able to get locked in and go. And it's a rare exercise where you're like seeing the muscle as you're training it, where a lot of the other movements for quads Quads, you might be able to maybe see them, but this is one where you're you can like look at your quads and be like, let's fucking go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My number one is going to be the pendulum the, oh, by a long how? shot. I, I should have guessed it would have been the pendulum or the hack squat. Yeah. Pendulum is my absolute number one. I it's so hard. It's exactly. like you put like 25 pounds on and you're like, am I the weakest person ever? Because this is so freaking hard. <laughs> Dude, I saw a video of Savannah, our friend Savannah. Mm -hmm. uh, she was on the pendulum today. It looked like she had two 45s and a, a band that was not, a, it wasn't reverse band. Is she a dog? I mean, she's on the Atlantis uh, oh my pendulum. gosh. That's so much. If, if that's what I really saw. That's impressive. I'm amazed. If she didn't have, like, you couldn't see the front of the pendulum. If she had no weight on the front and then she had two wheels on the back plus a band, bravo to her. Yeah. She's I jacked. Put hats off. Yeah. Um, the pendulum is, is a gut check. It makes me sick to my stomach before every <laughs> set. I love that feeling. It is such an enjoyable process to get into. I dream very frequently about having one here at the house and um, we just simply don't have enough space. And, and I'm sure as the summer goes on here, I'm going to think many, many a times of what can I move out to get it in? Mm -hmm. Or let's just put it in the center and, you know, walk around it. <laughs> <laughs> Throw a tarp over it when we're not using it. And then when we want to pull it out and then it's going to be right there. <laughs> oh my gosh. I would say another favorite of mine is the leg press. Again, common theme. I like the stability. I like really being able to have that output. Um, and obviously within the leg press, if you're trying to bias quads versus glutes, it is going to be a little bit different setup. And I do encourage you, we will have a playlist of different quad exercises. I encourage you to go watch the video because there is very common terms used of like for glutes, it's high and wide. And for quads, it's this way. Watch the video. I promise it can change the game for you. The next one would be the hack squat, which is hack squat pendulum. Both are going to be great. Um, if I had to select specific brands of either the pendulum or the hack, uh, the pendulum, I really like the Atlantis. And then uh, there's another one from a brand in Croatia. So they're not popular here in the States whatsoever, but it is called, their brand is called Predator. And both of those pendulums are fantastic. Uh, for the hack squat, Prime just came out with theirs. I have not gotten to use that yet. Um, I really like the Cybex. The Cy like the older Cybex one is what I grew up getting mm -hmm. to train on. And so I have like this dire love for the Cybex hack squat. Um, and so both like the, the Cybex and then the Atlantis is another one that their hack squat is phenomenal as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised you haven't said it so far, so I'll say it, but squats great one. And especially with the prime super squat bar, whether I'm doing glutes or quads, it has really helped me out um, within where the weight is positioned um, and allowing me to get the output that I really want with that movement. Yeah. So with the the safety squat bar and trying to bias quads, you definitely want to use the heel wedges mm -hmm. um, with that in place. Uh, to stay like staying upright with the uh, like the weight bearing more like towards your mid back can be a little bit challenging. It kind of pushes you more into a hinge position. So you have to be very cognizant to stay upright and be able to bias quads. Um, but that would go for really any of your back squat variations to try and bias quads is that you have to stay very upright and be cognizant of that as you push the knees forward. And so a common thing that many people will, will bring up is that front squats are going to bias quads more than the back squat. And that's not necessarily true. Again, it's going to come down to the individual's mechanics of mm -hmm. the exercise. Now the front squat is going to force you to stay more upright. And that's where the idea comes from of like, well, if you're going to already be more upright, it's 
probably going to be more quad biased, but at the same time, depending on how much we're able to hinge and those different factors, those limb links, we may still be in kind of like this 50, 50 split of glutes and quads. Whereas with the safety squat bar heel wedges in place, I would say that if you're going to do a back squat, that's probably your best option to try and bias quads. If you're only thinking like safety bar squat, barbell back squat or barbell front squat, I'm going to go with the safety bar squat probably being the easiest. Mm -hmm. Well, you took my next question. I was going to ask all about oh. front squats and back squats. Look so you beat me. me to it. Are there any other movements that you like to program or you personally like? Of course. Um, the split squat is going to be yeah. another one. I think the split That's squat a, is a, a huge one. Love to hate it. <laughs> the split squat's fantastic. I think that uh, the big thing there is being comfortable with pushing your knee forward mm -hmm. and getting to that degree of knee flexion feels foreign for a lot of people yeah. because there's just not many times that you can get to that level of knee flexion under load. Um, and then it's very easy to try and get your glutes more involved or trying to push your hips back and, and hinge more forward. So staying more upright, driving that knee forward, uh, your, your adductors are going to get some love here too. They're doing a, a lot of stabilization. So that split squats big there. Um, another exercise would be kind of like this front elevated front foot elevated split squat. Um, um, to where you're able to drive the knee forward in, in that setting as well. That may be more comfortable. I've, I've had some clients who prefer that over their, like just a, a front foot, uh, I'm sorry, uh, front heel elevated split squat. Mm -hmm. They like to have the front foot totally elevated and then that wedge in place and it just feels better for them um, with whatever their limb length or whatever the case may be. Um, the last thing would be a walking lunge would also be uh, another quad exercise where we can really get a lot of eccentric loading onto the quads and we're able to drive the knee forward and, and have a lot of knee flexion there as well. Mm -hmm. Do you ever program like a sissy squat or anything? Um, I don't program the sissy squat all that much. Um, sometimes I'll do like a banded reverse Nordic uh, for lengthening the rec fem because I am trying to do a better job of identifying and utilizing exercises that are lengthening the rec fem directly uh, because there is like the rec fem is going to be playing its role within um, different exercises where we're lengthening the quad for sure. And in the the back leg of a split squat, the rec fem is getting a lot of love in lengthening, but it's not going to get a ton of love. And so that reverse banded are the banded reverse Nordic is a great way to train that rec fem in more of a lengthened position. And then for a deadlift, can you bias your quads in a deadlift? Don't think so. Okay. I mean, I guess you, you could. So like the, the trap bar deadlift with a heel elevation, I was thinking of just like a conventional deadlift, mm -hmm. but looking at it more, um, completely, you have the, the trap bar deadlift with a lot of knee flexion and the heel heels elevated. I would say you're going to get some, some quad love there for sure. Mm -hmm. And with a barbell one, because you can't like drive your knees forward, it is very difficult, but I did have a client who did compete in powerlifting. I do not take on powerlifting clients. Uh, but it was something where Adam actually, Adam Miller helped me a lot with her programming and talked about the fact of, because she did have such strong quads, we could utilize those within the deadlift, not to cheat, but to use it to our benefit of letting those knees go in front of it a little bit before she pulled up. Um, so that was a cool thing to learn about just how you could, again, use your body to work with you instead of against you in those instances. Yeah. Well, I, I would also add to that of like, that's specific to the sport. Oh yeah. Like she's trying to increase the load mm -hmm. for the individual who's listening of just trying to improve body composition. I wouldn't try to yeah. get quads out of your deadlift if that's yeah. what you're trying to do. I agree with you. I just thought it was, you know, fun fact. Interesting fact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you have any like favorite supersets that you like to use for the exercises that we just mm -hmm. talked about? I mean, since my top two exercises um, were the leg press and the leg extension, I do like to pair those together, be able to get that length and that shortened, um, be able to just get after it. And again, because of that stability, it allows people to just do that of get after it. Do you have a preference of which one goes first or second? I've done both. Kind of depends on what the goal is of the session overall. Yeah, I think that the the leg extension going second generates so much overall fatigue that it's very difficult to try and train quads again in the week because of just the sheer in inability to get fully shortened after 
lengthening and trashing your quads mm -hmm. in the leg press. So um, I find it easier to recover from the leg extension first and then having whatever the, the lengthened exercise maybe is second. Um, so one that I really like and will use uh, from time to time is a single leg leg extension. And then I pair that with split squats. Mm. And you go back and forth. That and sounds horrible. It is horrible. Um, but if, <laughs> if you're trying to get like a lot of quad volume in yeah. a short amount of time and really push the threshold, you know, near failure, doing those two exercises together and that kind of um, round robin, if you will, is terrible. Um, <laughs> another way you could do it would be um, the leg extension paired with the pendulum or leg extension paired with the hack. And you're certainly going to you use less load on the pendulum or the hack than what you would if you were just doing straight sets, of course. Uh, but the output's extremely high and you're going to get a lot of muscular fatigue, I would say for sure. Yeah. I think that's such a great example of supersets altogether because we've talked about it before, but when it comes to supersets, a lot of times people just throw things together and they're just trying to make it hard. And like we talked about, all of those supersets are going to be hard, but that's not exactly why we just put them together. It's being able to look what part of the muscle is that working? How do I want the result to be? And then how am I going to use that to my benefit? Fit. So I think that those are great examples to be able to talk about why you line them up that way. Yeah, I would say the only two scenarios that I use supersets are going to be in the context of training the muscle at different lengths, like the, the hack squat and the leg extension, or I'm using it in a way that's saving time with muscle groups that are not going to impact one another in the, in the superset, meaning that maybe I have a, um, like a upper back pull down and then I have a anterior dumbbell front raise. Like my front delt is not taxed from me doing the pull downs. Mm -hmm. And so my the weight that I'm using in the front raise should not be impacted by me doing the upper back pull downs first. But it allows for me to get both those exercises done in a more time efficient manner as well as um, still getting you know max output on both the exercises. Mm -hmm. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Well, are you ready for some questions that we have from some listeners? Uh, sure. Let's, let's hear them. All right. Is training quads once a week enough? I think it's going to be something where it depends on where you're starting at. But for the, the grand scheme of things, if your overarching goal is to grow your quads, I would say getting it in twice a week is probably going to be your best bet to get the most bang for your buck per session. Um, maybe going with something where you're having six. If your goal is to get 12 total sets in a week, maybe you go six sets on the the week or the first session of the week and then the second session having six there as well. Um, you have to be very intelligent with your program design uh, when it comes to the exercises that you're selecting because if I was to go in and do something where I have the pendulum and then I have the split squats, in the same session, um, that's a, I mean, that's very systemically fatiguing and a lot for your quads to recover from. Uh, now, if you're doing like a Monday is your first session and Thursday is your second, then at that point, you've got 72 hours. You should 100% be ready to train quads again after that 72 hour period. But if I was to do the pendulum and the split squat in that first session, it's it's a 50, 50 chance that I'll be ready to go Thursday morning for that mm -hmm. session. So it may be better to have the leg extension and then also the pendulum in that first session. And then in the second one, maybe you go the leg extension again. And if you're trying to grow your quads, you're going to get kind of sick of the leg extension yeah. because it's just one of those 
exercises that's going to be in every one of your sessions yeah. because it's the only exercise that we have that's going to train that rec fem in the shortened position, uh, as well as be able to accumulate a, a greater overall um, volume to the tissue without having a ton of systemic fatigue. Like every other exercise, majority of the other exercise that you're doing within the pendulum, within the hack squat, within a back squat, a leg press, all these are going to train your quads really well, but the systemic fatigue that you're going to experience with all those is fairly high. Mm -hmm. And so recoverability is, is one of the biggest challenges when it comes to quad training, really any of your lower body training in general, but specifically quads here. Um, and so you may have leg extension in the second session and then hack in the second session there. And so that's how I would balance it and definitely hit it twice a week. Does training legs boost testosterone? So I've, I've heard this forever, I feel like. I feel like everyone has said this. And, and to me, it's just been something where I think of it in the concept of, well, <clears throat> training is going to be a thing for your overall health and well-being. You're probably going to consistently eat better. Sex hormone production is going to be better because of all encompassing. So it's kind of like a domino effect of training. So I was always kind of like chalked it up to that. And um, I did a little bit of research because a client had asked about it. And what the research actually says is that there is an a, a, a acute spike in testosterone following a lower body training session, but it is not something that's going to be substantial enough to where it's like, my testosterone for a male was at 700. And then I started to train legs more consistently. And now my testosterone's at 850. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not how that works, but you're having an acute response after training the lower body that would be in place. Mm -hmm. Why do I have knee pain when training quads? probably because you're doing it very poorly. <laughs> um, it's either that you're doing things poorly or we have a muscular imbalance that is crossing the knee joint. So we have you know three muscle groups that are going to be crossing uh, between the gastroc, the cat, or I'm sorry, the gastroc, the quad, and the hamstring. And there may be something going on there that is such a strong imbalance that you're having discomfort because of that. But I would lean more more towards you're doing things incorrectly, and we're bouncing out of movements. We're getting outside of our active range of motion. Something along those lines. Yeah, not lined up with the cam on certain exercises. I see that with a lot of knee pain for like leg extension is because you're not lined up with the pad and the seat and you're not lined up with the cam. And so you're putting so much tension on that knee joint overall. How does training legs help the upper body? I, I don't have a specific answer to this. Do you have something? Uh, no, but it's just a question that was submitted. I would say that if I were to answer it, it would just be the aspect of being able to have those stronger legs allows you to have possibly better performance overall of like I talked about within pregnancy of because you can carry the load, then you might have better strength for other aspects. And there are things within if you're training legs and you're bracing your core, then maybe that might translate to having a stronger upper body. Uh, but I was a little bit perplexed by the question. Yeah. I mean, just don't be a bitch, bro. <laughs> <laughs> like if you, if you're training a bunch of upper body and you're not training your legs, you just, it's not a good look look as well as your ego is going to get, take a hit too. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, just have a balanced training approach. And your functionality is going to be in the dumps. Exactly. <laughs> Can training legs stunt your growth? This is another one I've actually dug into because I had, um, my dad coaches the middle school baseball team back in my hometown. And he had a co or he had a parent ask him this question. And I wanted to be able to not only just say no, but also give him reason as to why I believe that to be the case. And there's, there's two papers that I was able to, to find. And both of those papers had no evidence that it was going to fracture the, the growth plates. Um, I think the the biggest thing within young adults, or I'm sorry, not young adults, chill, like kids who are going to be lifting where they're concerned about their growth plates is that they're not having the proper guidance to resistance training that is thereafter causing injury. And then by having the injury and the lack of movement, that could be cumbersome to their overall growth, depending on what the injury may have been. And so the thing with, with, children or, or kids lifting is more so around the education and doing things properly rather than it being like, this is bad for their growth plates or it's going to have a fracture of the gro growth plates or whatever the case may be. So no. Mm -hmm. And then how could you train quads at home? Training quads at home 
you can certainly do the the split squats. I think that that would be a viable option. Uh, we'll have a video in the show notes going over how to set up this uh, rigged hack squat that you can do at home with a foam roller and some heel wedges and some dumbbells that you can certainly do. There are banded leg extension variations that you can also do. Um, those would be the three main exercises. If you're trying to grow your quads at home and you have some equipment, you know, you're going to need dumbbells. You're going to need bands. It's not going to be something where it's like, I only have body weight. Yeah. What can I do? Like you're going to be able to do a little bit of some, something, but it's not going to be from a hypertrophy standpoint. It's more so going to be calorie expenditure. Like you're going to be able to do some air squats and expend some calories, but it's not going to put on a bunch of tissue to your quads. Yeah. Cause you can do like a pike leg extension, but again, you're not able to like really load the tissue. Um, and some clients that might have something like a TRX, I'll have them do like a suspension sissy squat, but you're really limiting yourself of how much you can load. So that growth is going to be very difficult to come by. So if you have dumbbells, you may be able to make it happen. Um, but if you don't have dumbbells are of, you know, of significant weight relatively, you're going to be in a hindered spot for sure. Mm -hmm. And the last question I have here is why the heel elevation with quads? I touched on it a little bit earlier, um, but it is going to be a limitation to knee flexion for most that their calves are just tight. And so that's going to be the limiting factor by having the heel elevation in place that eliminates that, um, provided that the heel wedge is significant enough to alleviate it. So some individuals, it could be as little as like five degrees, which is probably pretty close to what uh, like a five pound plate would be under your heel or like a two and a half pound plate under your heel. And then like a 10, 10 degree wedge is what I generally recommend for most as this is going to um, knock things out for a majority of individuals. And then if we're having a lot, like if they have really long femurs and they have a lot of tightness through their ankles, um, then a 20 degree wedge is going to be helpful there. Well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have anything else that you wanted to touch on or give advice to someone when training their quads or trying to grow their quads? I think that quads are something that you've got to get to a dark place to be <laughs> able to really grow them. And so getting into a, a headspace where you're really able to get after it and, and push the threshold of failure is going to be the main way that you make this happen. And I, you could say that for many muscle groups, but I think that quads and, and hamstrings to a degree are two that need that type of, of tough love, dig deep, get into a crazy headspace to make it happen. And so if that's your goal, you know, it takes some really hard training sessions um, and being able to find that understanding of failure is going to be huge because far too many people when it comes to lower body training are cutting off way earlier than actual mm -hmm. failure uh, because, you know, they're losing some stability somewhere or they are getting scared. They're getting a little nervous. It hurts. It's painful, you know, whatever the it's case hard. may be. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's one, I think one of the harder muscle groups to really uh, grow because of how deep you've got to take things. Yeah. Which with that, I'll go ahead and add a video of a train with us where we're training quads and push into the depths of that, because yeah. I think it's good to see visually of what it really looks like to train to failure because we only have our own experience or what we've been pushed to in the past and being able to see like, oh, I see how much they're struggling, how much they're pushing themselves can be really helpful. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to check out the cheat sheet in the show notes and we'll catch you in the rest of the muscle series.